All right, I want to uh, thank everybody for coming. Uh, this is a nice turnout. Uh, today we're going to have a presentation from Dr. Mike Marshall here, and his presentation is going to be How Kinesiology Changed My Life. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, Dr. Marshall uh, had a 14-year major league career. I think he played with 10 different teams, two of Marty Moran pilots in the Expos. Uh, so he was from 1967-1981. There we go. One more. Uh, he's uh, still, uh, you retired, what, about 30 years ago? Something like that. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. And he still, he still has 15 Major League Baseball records. Is that correct? Which is uh, amazing. Uh, he was Fireman of the Year in 73, 74, 75. Uh, he was a Major League Baseball selection for All Star Pitcher, 74 to 75. That was when he was with the Dodgers, correct? Yes. And he won the Cy Young Award in 1974. Uh, all right. Outside of his Major League Baseball career, he also was a, a college coach. And uh, see, I told him earlier, you know, I remember the big bushy yeah. uh, mustache in the side where he was there. That was mid seventies. <laughs> <laughs> coach for twenty three years. He was a coach at Michigan State University, University of Tampa, St. Leo College, Henderson State, <laughs> West Texas A and M. Uh, he was a a college professor. Uh, he got his BS, MS, and PhD in physical education and exercise physiology, Michigan State. Uh, he earned all of his degrees while he was a professional athlete, while he was playing Major League Baseball, which is incredible to me. Uh, and he was a professor of kinesiology, like I said, for 10 years. Uh, outside of that, once he retired, uh, he continued to do his research in uh, pitching. Uh, he's a noted scholar, researcher, he's presented, published, uh, researched several different major academic conferences, and he now has his own pitching academy in Zephyr Hills, Florida, and I think we have a few of his uh, students here today. Uh, and his, most of his uh, research is over pitching mechanics, and he's interested specifically in improving uh, pitching effectiveness and preventing injuries uh, in athletes. So his, uh, the, the title of his presentation today is going to be How Kinesiology changed my life, and so I will stop talking and I'll put this back on. Uh, do you want the overhead first? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, just I'll turn it off and let you get to the overhead. Okay. And I want to present uh, Dr. Mike Marsh. Thank you. Now I'm going to set these on the other side. First of all, thanks for coming. I just enjoy the opportunity to talk to anybody about kinesiology, and uh, thank you, no Dr. Silva, for Absolutely. inviting me to do this. It's always a pleasure to talk kinesiology. And uh, if you're interested in more of what I'm going to say today, I have a website, and it has uh, most of the information I'll give you today there. I have a baseball pitching instructional videotape that's online for free. My book is on, online, uh, Coaching Baseball Pitchers, is there free. Question and answer files that, that I've been answering for over 10 years now. It's rather complete. And we have a whole bunch of videos where you, uh, and a high speed film that shows you the baseball pitching motion. Um, the way that kinesiology changed my life, I had my kinesiology course with uh, Professor Bill Huesner, graduate of the University of Illinois under um, Curtin. Remember Curtin? Anybody remember uh, Curtin? Great researcher, great uh, kinesiologist, too. Uh, but uh, Bill Huesner had been a swimming coach at the University of Minnesota before uh, he came to Michigan State as a, as a professor. And I'm sitting in this kinesiology class, and he explained how he studied the breaststroke in swimming back at that time by taking high-speed film through uh, windows in the side of the pool of breaststrokers swimming in front uh, of the camera and he had markings for uh, the hip, and he followed the progression of the swimmer. And he was able to get, I think, two full strokes, you know, the arm stroke and then the, the leg kick, arm stroke and leg kick. And he wanted to uh, evaluate uh, the, uh, how much they accelerated with each arm action and each leg kick. And what he discovered was there were dramatic changes in the 
movement of the body forward. If you took the center mass of the body, it was going forward in jerks and starts. So with the resistance of the water, of course, you expect you to, to be slowed down quickly. And what he determined from this, well, he'd take uh, <clears throat> displacement, velocity, and acceleration curves. I don't know where you are in your courses or whatever, but he explained how to do that, where he would measure the displacement, and from that, by knowing the time frame uh, that the displacement occurred, you could calculate velocity. And then once you could calculate the changes in velocity, you could then determine the acceleration. And of course, swimming is a uniform velocity activity. You're not trying, like in a baseball pitch, where we're accelerating to a moment of maximum release, and that's an acceleration activity. We're like jogging and uh, uh, swimming would be a uniform velocity activity. So he wanted to see how uniform the velocity was, and he found that there were great drop-offs. You, you go fast and you slow down. It's fast, slow down. And what he did then as a result of that is he changed the arm action and the leg kick so that you didn't have the, you had a little quicker stroke to it, less, less power in each one, but he was able to keep the body moving more uniformly forward without the slowing downs. And he dramatically changed breaststroke technique as a result of that. Well, I'm sitting here listening, it's just amazed that you could quantify human performance. That you actually can turn it from an art form into a scientific phenomenon. And I immediately, at the time, I was a minor league shortstop. And so I took high-speed film of baseball batting. It, what his point was, you can't know what's going on unless you see what's going on in very slow motion. Things happen, and certainly in baseball batting and baseball pitching, that are just too fast to be seen otherwise. You know, just a lot of going, lot of things going on. Uh, so I, I took a, a first high-speed film of a baseball batting. And I learned a lot. <clears throat> but then, uh, because of a bad back I had in a car accident when I was a kid, I changed to pitching. And it, it, it turned out that uh, that worked well for me. I, I seemed to have an aptitude for pitching. I got to the big leagues uh, in 67 with the Detroit Tigers. Uh, and I pitched for the Tigers. I was a right-handed relief pitcher, setup guy mainly. Uh, I closed some games when the right-handed batters were batting. Otherwise, a left-handed pitcher would come in and close the game if left-handed batters were batting in the, in the, at the end of the game. And I had a 1.98 earned run average that year, which those of you familiar with baseball say that's pretty good for a rookie. At the end of the year, and I should say also, after I finished that course, I graduated, uh, got my bachelor's degree in 65 the following year, and Bill Huesner was expanding the course uh, that he had, and he needed a, a lab assistant. He taught one lab, and he needed another uh, lab assistant, and he asked me to be that. Probably the best thing that ever happened to me in my life is I got the exposure of teaching this stuff. You don't learn anything until you have to teach it. You gotta, when you become a teacher, you understand what that means. You think you know a lot now, but try teaching it, and then you'll find out that you don't know much. Then you'll, then you'll start learning how to, about what you're talking about. Anyway. I got to teach this. So now I'm playing professional ball, and then I'm going back to school every fall and winter quarter at Michigan State, playing in the spring and summer playing professional ball to finance my education. And uh, after the 70, 67 season, I came home, and uh, one day I noticed as I was trying to shave that I couldn't bend my arm up. And in fact, I can't. See that? I can't touch my shoulder. Now, you should be able to touch your shoulder. We couldn't figure out, I couldn't figure out what is this all about. And then I checked the extension and you see I can't extend my arm. I can extend the other arm, but I can't extend that arm. So here we got a mystery. How many kinesiologists in here are taking kinesiology? This should be your take home assignment. Why, can that, why did baseball pitching change my ability to flex my pitching arm and extend my pitching arm? What could be the problem? Well, I approached Bill Huser with this very question, and he said, well, first thing we know, we've got to get x-rays. We've got to see what the encumbrance is, what is preventing these actions to occur, because I think most of you can straighten your arm all the way out and, and touch your shoulder. We should probably have a, a drill to see, but we'll move forward. Um, the x-rays came back, and I, I've got them here. Oh, yeah, it's somewhere. And let's, let me show them to you now. Uh, unfortunately, x-rays when you try to put them on, uh, you know, they don't show up as well as, as the x-rays do if you're looking at x-rays, the actual x-rays. So we, 
we'll take a look at this and see what we got, what we have from this. Uh, it's upside down and backwards, probably. Okay, here we are. This is, this is my pitching arm here, electron process. The difficulty is you can't see here as nicely as you can see here. Now, right there, that's the electron process, right up there. And that's the faucet. See it behind it? See that uh, <coughs> this line of bone? That's the faucet. <laughs> and you can straighten your arm until the point where the process contacts the faucet. You can't go any farther than that. And that is my non pitching arm. And you can see that it's, it's you know, relatively straight. Over here, and this is what I was apologizing for, is you don't have the same uh, beautiful picture that you see on that side. But you look at it, and if you take a midline, oh, <laughs> trying to say I'm short? No. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you're straight. I thought it helped you a little. <laughs> it's right here. Now I can touch it. Anyway, if you put a, a dot in the midline, a dot in the middle of the joint, and a dot in the middle of the uh, ulna bone of the forearm, you can calculate the angle. And what we find out and what we can see if we had the x-ray is that the hyaline cartilage of the electronon fossa, I hope I you understand some of the anatomical terms, had calcified. Well, what causes, what caused that? What will cause a uh, hyaline cartilage to calcify? Well, the body protects itself, so it's doing something to protect itself by calcifying. All right, so, but we'll just leave that for now. We now know the reason why I can't, extract, can't straighten my arm all the way out. Now let's take a look at the, uh, the flexion side. See if I can get that on backwards first. Yeah. And uh, there we go. I think we can all whoops, get it up. It's like patting your head and rub your stomach. <laughs> okay. The coronoid process is the protuberance on the uh, anterior side of the ulna bone. The electronine is back here. Electronine back there, and it goes around close the, the, the trochlear part. Anyway. Here is the length of the coronary process in my pitching elbow. Here it is in my glove elbow. And if you look at them comparatively, wow. See how much longer this is compared to my glove arm? For some reason, my coronary process lengthened. Therefore, when it goes into the coronary fossa, it can't go in as far as if it were not lengthened. I lost 12 degrees of my extension and flexion range of motion, which means I lost 12 degrees of my range of motion to the pitching arm, and I can't, can't come up right now with what the, what the range of motion is, but it's not 180 degrees. You know, whatever it is, it's not 180 degrees. It's, I think it's something like 160 something. So, but that's significant. Um, in, in, in my book, and I think even in my uh, uh, video, Andy Messersmith, you know, you know, you guys don't know. <laughs> have lost 34 degrees of his flexion and 33 degrees of his extension range of motion. This is not an uncommon problem. 70, oh, I mean, 67 degrees in a range of motion of a, of, a, of a pitching arm, he lost pitch major league baseball. He was an outstanding pitch major league pitcher. Outstanding. He finished second to me in 1974 in the Cy Young, and he was a high quality pitcher. But obviously, you can't pitch having lost 67 degrees of your flexion extension range of motion at your full of potential. You can't. You can't lose range of motion. Okay. So, um, we had to solve what, this, uh, what happened here. That video that you saw me loading uh, is the film that we took to try to figure out what caused these problems. But before I go to that, I want to bring in, uh, just a little more anatomy into our, into our lives. Because a kinesiologist is, is certainly a biomechanist. That is, he has to understand the, the, uh, the, the science behind. Mainly, you have to understand Newton's three laws of motion, how they apply to force application. But let's talk a bit. See, does that come out right? Yeah, it looks good. Everybody's got to know the pitching elbow, right, pitchers? You've got to know all of this. If you don't, you, you know, what are you doing? Here again is that electronic process. Here again is a coronary process. This is the trophy I, I mentioned to you where it rotates around it. 
This is the ulna bone. The ulna bone is involved in flexion and extension. This is the radius bone. It's involved in supination and pronation. I'll